try something right at the beginning. Sure. Why did you start writing? If you've read Joe Lansdale, you love Joe Lansdale. I wanted to be one ever since I found comic books. But when I read Ed Rice first, I knew I had to be one. I didn't want to be one. I had to be one. You know, he lives in Nacogdoches, Texas. It's one of the oldest towns in Texas. It's got so much heritage and so much history. Who the F is this guy? Great writer who can kill you not only with words, but with his hands. And Davy Crockett was in Congress in Tennessee. And in fact, when he left, he says, you can all, when he lost, he you can all go to hell and I'm going to Texas. Because that didn't turn out so good for him. You know, he died at the Alamo with a lot of other people. I want everyone to know that not only is he a great artist, but he's a wonderful father. You remember when I had him, he almost had to stand on top of it to get it to type. He died at his typewriter, which is the best way to go, you know? And that is the trailer for All Hail the Popcorn King, a movie that has a unbelievable cast list to it. And the director of the movie is on the show with us now. I'd like to introduce the director, uh, Hansi Oppenheimer. Thank you for coming on the show with us. Thanks for inviting me. This is a story about the Joe, uh, the writer Joe R. Lansdale, who wrote over 50 novels and 500 short stories, probably the most popular among them, in my opinion, and, and for listeners of the show, uh, was turned into a movie starring Bruce Campbell, directed by Phantasm director Don Coscarelli, Bubba Hotep, which is uh, one of my favorite uh, d d just goofy movies of all time. <laughs> It's just a brilliant piece of work, isn't it? It's it, just they, they captured everything like perfectly, you know, Bruce and Dom and Joe. They just, and Aussie, <laughs> they just nailed it. And I've only seen the movie, I think maybe once or twice. So I don't, I didn't remember if it had been based on a story, but this uh, email came into me from the studio saying that it was based on the, uh, the works of author writer, Joe R. Lansdale, who I had not heard of. And that's honestly, sometimes uh, for the better that you don't have a preconceived notion of what a documentary should be when it's about somebody you have no idea, no idea who they're about. Um, I've watched documentaries about people that I were familiar with the projects they were involved with, but didn't know who the flip and flap the person was, but I'm <laughs> glad that I uh, have a chance to check out this documentary soon and for you to come on the show to talk about, uh, how you got involved and who Joe R. Lansdale was. Uh, he's a pretty interesting character. Um, you know, he lives in Nagadocious, Texas. It's like the oldest town in Texas. It's about an hour from Shreveport. Um, he's just like a writing machine. Like he writes three hours a day. Um, that's just, you know, and he loves it. It's not like a burden. This is just what he does. And then he does his other things. He's also a 12th level black belt and teaches his own form of martial arts. Um, he's helped out tons of writers in the community. That's how I was able to get people like Christopher Golden and Joe Hill and all those people because, you know, they all owe a debt to Joe because when they were starting out, he would give them advice and, um, and, and you, he's, he's, uh, he's kind of got like a, a journeyman kind of ethic towards the work, you know, he doesn't, you know, I'm a great artist, none of that kind of crap. He's like, you know, I just sit down and I work on it, you know, <laughs> And it's refreshing these days to have an artist like that. Um, we traveled around and looked at some of the, because I'm a big cowboy kink person. You know, I love the Old West. So he took me around to a lot of places that, that, that were historical. That That's a new one for me. I've never heard of cowboy kink before. I've heard of other kinks. <laughs> but that's a whole other show that we're, we don't cover, so... <laughs> But uh, but just the way the trailer made it sound, it sounded like Joe was dead. I was like, oh, that's sad. <laughs> that's not true. I have to ask other people if they had that. But but no, Joe is very much. Alive. Okay, that's and, good. It just it just yeah. again the way it's worded in the trailer, the guy talking about him, which I'm assuming is probably Joe himself. It sounded like Joe was dead. <laughs> no. Uh, but. Uh, I Years. You also have uh, you have Bruce Campbell. Oh, that's 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 a great get. Bruce Campbell, Mick Garris, or whatever, who I've tried to have on the show multiple times. And I'm friends. I'm friends with Mick on Facebook, and we talk on Facebook, but I can't ever get him on the show. Don Coscarelli, uh, I've met in person and tried to have on the show, but uh, these are great people, and they of course they worked on that uh, that Bubba Hotep. or Masters of Horror. I have watched Masters of Horror. I've no, I've watched every episode of Masters of Horror. Road is based on one of Joe's stories directed by Don Coscarelli. Which one is it? Uh, Incident on and off a mountain road. It's the first uh, episode in, in the first season. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then I am familiar with it. Yes. 
yeah, he's all over the place. He's got a piece in Love, Death, and Robots. Um, he's got a piece in Creepshow. Um, it's so weird. He's he's not a household name, but like no. when you start his <laughs> work, you're like, oh my god, I know who this guy is because he's got such a unique voice. What uh, segment was his in Creepshow? The uh, the the new TV series or one of the movies? Uh, it was the new series that Greg Nicotero um, produced, and he wrote it along with his son Keith and daughter Casey. It's the one, the companion. <gasps> oh, I did like that one. <laughs> Yeah, that was a really good one. Darn, I think Cold in July is one of those movies that I have been dying to watch, and it just it always escapes me until I think about it right now. But Love, Death, and Robots I was definitely familiar with, and that's where his name was ringing a bell in my head because I just recently watched that. Uh, he did Fish Night in the Dump, which I found really yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. I love the dump. The dump was the best. I love the dump. <laughs> okay, see, now I have to find this guy and have him on my show too because he wrote uh, four episodes of two of my favorite cartoon series of all time, Batman and Superman, the animated series. Oh yeah. He did those as well. You should definitely talk to Joe. He's, he's an amazing person to talk to. I mean, Re he's so well read and so pop culture attuned and just the nicest guy you could imagine. Pensions for a dream is actually, um, Pensions for a dream and identity crisis are two of the most talked about, episodes ever pension for the dream is where we get the iconic i am the i am uh i am the knight i am justice i am batman from um <laughs> and showdown was the first animated and first actual media appearance ever of jonah hex and identity... i love jonah hex so much it's one of my favorite graphic novels an identity crisis is probably i think the one episode i will show to any fan who's just like i don't know i'm a big fan of superman i'm like you gotta watch this superman has to kill clark kent in order to save somebody on death row and the gu the person who frame who's framed the guy on death row and thinks he's killed clark kent doesn't figure out who the two are until the uh, executioner is pulling the uh, lever down on his on his uh, on his death warrant in the in the electric chair, and I was just like, oh, "That was a Superman cartoon! Oh, <laughs> chilling! That was an episode of Superman. They they shied away from death on Batman with his parents, but wow! <laughs> yeah, Joe uh, pulls no punches. He um, his stuff. Um, I mean. He comes from a really diverse place, but he also is aware of using things that are on PC to say those things and to point them out. And so it's, um, you know, it gives it a little bit more reality and, um, you know, and they're dark. What made you want to, uh, why this particular author to do a documentary on? Is it because of how just unknown he is? Uh, well, so I've been reading him since the 80s. Um, you know, I first discovered him, and he's going to be mad at me for saying this, but in the Splatterpunk movement in the 80s, which nobody in that movement wants to be called Splatterpunk. <laughs> I've talked to them all, Scow and uh, Skip and everybody, and they were like, we hate that term. But, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I discovered his work then, and I think it was the night at the horror show. It was in Silver Screams, edited by McGarris, I think, or Scow, David Scow, I think. And David Scow, I think, swore never to edit another book because it was such a pain in the ass. <laughs> but um, that's a crazy story. And when I was in Nagadocious, Joe was telling me, like, oh, yeah, that's where they drag the dead dog and all these other things. And I'm like, these things happened? <laughs> You know, and then he puts them together in his own weird way and makes them even more surreal. Is that your favorite production of his? Well, that's, that's one of his uh, uh, short stories. Um, but anyway, so I've been reading him since the 80s. And, um, you know, once social media started happening, um, we started chatting on Twitter. And then I was a guest at a convention in Houston. And, you know, being from New York, I didn't realize that you know, um, Texas is big. <laughs> so I was kind of like, hey, how about I come to Nagadocious and do an interview with you for my YouTube? It is so, so big. They are dealing with so many problems right now that we will not get into. No, but the, the, the distances in Texas, if you are if you live in New York City, like, you're used to being able to, like, 15 miles is, like, a lot. So, like, yeah, I went there and I was staying with a friend in Houston and um, Houston, Houston. Sorry, in New York, there's Houston Street. So I always have to think about that. <laughs> are they are they are they spelt the same way? Yes. <laughs> oh wow. 
that would do it, yeah. <laughs> but um, but a friend drove me down to Nagadocious, and she hung out with um Joe's wife Karen while Joe and I went into the dojo and we did the interview. And Joe was just like like you know I had twenty years of reading his work and wanted to know like why did you do this? How did this book? And he was just so lovely and you know just t- telling me. And so the story for the drive-in is kind of a crazy story that he um. When he would get stuck on an idea, his wife would make this really lethal popcorn with Kroger grease, which was lard, and then oh. he'd have fever dreams from it, and the driving came out of these fever dreams. And um, yeah, Don Coscarelli talks about it, too, because he ate the popcorn, and they spent the whole night afraid of, like, snakes coming into Lansdale's house while he was sleeping. <laughs> Water moccasins. But, um, yeah, so... Uh, I got really obsessed with this whole popcorn idea and I thought it was really fascinating. And, uh, you know, Joe was just, just really open. And then, um, I was working on a documentary about Joe Bob Briggs and, um, I know that I guy. Asked, yeah, I love Joe Bob. Yeah. Um, he's been know, on the show was, and uh, Darcy. Yeah. I was doing a piece about his return and the fans response to his return. Which and, has been um, rabid. <laughs> But, you know, it was great. I asked people to send me videos talking about how happy they were to have him back. And then I asked Joe if he would write something. And he goes, you know, I, I only used to read him in the Dallas Boring News, but I can write something. And, you know, he's and he's such a master. He, like, wrote this beautiful piece, sent it to me in 24 hours. I read it, and it's, like, beautiful and touching and gross and funny. And I got all weepy. And then I was like, okay, well, it's too beautiful to cut up. So we need someone to read it. So I looked, I looked at some actors and like, then I'm like, you know what? Joe has to read this. It has to be in his voice. Cause he's got this East Texas accent. That's very unique. And, uh, you know, I, I hit him up again and said, sorry to bother you again, but <laughs> do you think you could re- we could record you reading this? And he's like, okay. And then I said, I promise next documentary I make will be on you. And of course he said, no, no, no. But then once we started making the film, um, Joe was really collaborative, a wonderful mentor, helped me get some of the big names. I mean, he's, he's really been a wonderful person to work with. Talk a little bit about Fangirl Gaze, your podcast. Oh, yeah. Well, um, I'm currently taking a break from that just um, because I, I'm really more of a visual person than audio person. And I think podcasts, you need to be good at audio. Um, but it was it was fun. Briefly, we had a whole bunch of women in horror like Phyllis Rose, Dana DiLorenzo, Dee Wallace, um, Andrea Subasati. Um, Who's that? You know, we had, um, she is the editor, ch- editor-in-chief of Room Org. Oh. She does faculty horror podcast. They are, they are, um, they, they, uh, they are the uh, strongest, longest running uh, magazine uninterrupted now, uh, with uh, you know, the, like uh, uh, famous monsters of Filmland came back, but they had a huge break, and Fangoria broke up and unfortunately broke up again due to reasons we'll, we won't get into. I, I actually but... shot a video at the when they came back. They did a little thing with um, Lloyd and Larry Fessenden and Tony yeah. Timpone. I, I did a big. Uh, I did go. I, I what's okay? So what's really? I'm gonna edit this part out because it's not really important. But you're a you're a, you you do this whole thing which I'm on YouTube right now looking at. Uh, we did a whole like salute goodbye, play taps to Fangoria magazine when it ended in 2017. And then in 2018, we had the new person on and like all these other writers on the show. And we were like celebrating their return. And everyone was like commenting on the other videos. Like, you know, they came back, you know, they came back. And I'm like, if you look at the timestamp of when we did this video (laughs) and when it was announced, Fangoria was dying dead in the water and going out of business. It makes more sense than your stupid comments about how, don't you know they're back? Don't you know they're back every five minutes or whatever. Because then look at this video right here in the comment section that says, hey, by the way, people, we posted this when Foringoria said that they're dead. <laughs> Here's the video congratulating their return with the new people, explaining their the original people's, you know, problems and yada, yada, yada. Now I have to do another video to be like, Fangoria died again due to Sinistate's um, <clears throat> stuff, and these are the reasons why. I mean, I grew up on Fangoria. Like, you know, famous monsters in Fangoria... I, you know, as you can see from my YouTube, I, I'm multi pandemic. I participate in many, many fandoms. Right. And you see that in all the fandoms. 
um, you know, there's always the trolling, there's always the troublemakers, there's the people who like, oh, you're ruining my childhood, there's people who are going after, you know, people who want to see more diversity. It's, you know, um, as, as my friend Lindsay Burnus, who um, has written seven books on Supernatural, actually, I think it might be nine by now. Um, Wait, what was her name? She says, you know, we're Lindsay Burnus. Oh, she just came on She's my show, too. Awesome. Yeah, she just came on. Um, oh, she just came on my supernatural. Yeah, yeah, she just came on my supernatural podcast for yeah. a supernatural psychology really special. Close. She and I wrote the script for Squee, which um, we kind of got screwed because the editor bailed after a year, so we had to cut it down to ten minute shorts because I just couldn't afford to hire a new editor to do the whole thing, and it would have taken another year. I just wanted to get it out. But yeah, Lynn and I are really close, and she has said, you know, where there is great passion, there is great wink. <laughs> So that, that's fandom. Oh, okay. I got okay. Yeah, I got it now. <laughs> and, and, and you're right. It does. It does uh, hurt a lot of different. It, it does reach out to a lot of different avenues in media, specifically like the horror community. Just kind of you know, like, and we're in the middle of quarantine, and then the riots and the political stuff going well, on at the White shit. House. Joe Bob is now like people are suddenly like, oh, Joe Bob is sexist. It's like. I saw that too, and I was just like, "Have you ever watched this thing? Are you just picking up on one thing he says?" The guy, if you ever meet the person? He's one of the most open-minded, nicest people in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, did we you know, did we forget is... how to laugh all of a sudden? Did George Carlin dying destroy comedy? I mean, <laughs> George Carlin I mean, once jo said, "Everything is funny in context." <laughs> I'm, you know, for the character that John Bloom is playing. It's perfectly appropriate the jokes he makes, and you know, and I think I have Darcy there, which is almost like this father-daughter relationship, you know, because of their age difference, and her just rolling her eyes at his like, it's just adorable, and, right? Uh, you know, I I don't believe you know he's. I mean, I, I the people I know who worked with him like him, so I've never heard anything untoward about him. He just makes really bad dad jokes. <laughs> Yeah, and I, 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 I've, I've, for the most part, for the through season two, I was actually able to follow um, the movies on Twitter and see the comments sometimes, and then see that the next day and being like, "What is this person? Never watched this guy before? Did, or what yeah, is well, this?" There, you know, there are people who weren't around in the '80s. They weren't watching Monster Vision. They didn't, you know. I mean, all the shows he had before this. I mean, there are people who weren't aren't old enough to have lived through that with him. You know, I mean. God, I remember looking forward to that so much, you know? <laughs> he had so little back then. Right, right. I mean, um, for every, basically, it seemed like every horror host we had, one would die off, go away, or become. Um, well, they were all old, pretty much. I mean, what, what I mean is, like, we didn't have, younger. like, we, did, we, we had them. We sometimes had them overlapping each other, which was great because then we had multiple content, but it seemed like it was just, like, one at a time, and it killed. It, 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 yeah, sorry, I'm tripping over my words. It made it exactly what you just said. The amount of content that we got wasn't there. Whereas today, it's everywhere. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can find anything, you know, it's amazing. But yeah, then, like, oh, you know, you were tuned to what TNT or TBS or whatever it was, you know, Monster Vision every weekend. It was like. Is there anything else you'd like to say about the documentary before we let you go and um, any information oh, uh, that we may not have covered about it? Well, I mean, we're super proud of it. We did five screenings. One of them was in, we were invited by George R. R. Martin to screen at his uh, cinema in Santa Fe, which was an amazing moment. Sitting on the stage with George Martin doing the Q&A and Joe Lansdale. And I'm sitting in the middle and it's just like, is this real life? <laughs> it was just the best. And then I mentioned that all our budget. <laughs> I think George's brain stopped for a moment, like, oh, you can't do that. Nobody can do that. Um, but but the film is really fun, and we, um, you know, it's, if you don't know Joe Lansdale, you'll still enjoy the film because, you know, it's a fun film, and we have so many great people in it, and it'll make you want to go out and read Joe's books or watch Joe's films. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show to uh, educate us about this uh, really relatively unknown author, um, that I wasn't too, too familiar with, but I uh, got to learn learn more and more about him uh, researching the documentary little by little and uh, understanding that I've uh, actually been a big fan of his body of work without realizing it. Um, Here's a crazy story. Just one crazy story. Sorry, one more. So when I was interviewing Joe Hill, okay, Stephen King's son. Right, the Joe author. Hill said the drive, reading The Drive-In when he was 12 made him want to be a writer. Oh, wow. One of Joe's book, and I'm like, 
but your dad's Stephen King. Like, wouldn't you just be a writer anyway? But like, that it, that it was Joe that made him want to be a writer. I, you know, like, you know, kudos to Joe for like, you know, such inventive stories. That's that's a that's interesting. That's very amazing, um, especially when you say that again. Yeah, his father is Stephen King, so it's just like, no, it wasn't your like, dad. What more do you need to want to be a writer? Your father Stephen King, for God's sakes. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show. We can't wait to check out the documentary when it comes out, and uh, we wish you all the best luck. Okay, thanks so much. It was a pleasure talking to you. Tonight on the show, we have writer Joe Lansdale on the show with us, writer of Bubba Hope Tap, as well as a uh, prolific DC animated writer for the character Jonah Hex. Thank you for coming on the show with us, Joe. Thank you for having me. And recently, you also were working on Creep Show, correct? The new revival show on Shudder? Well, they uh, used one of the stories that I wrote with my son and daughter. We didn't do the adaptation. Matt Bain did. But yes, we worked with Creep Show in that way. Okay, which, uh, which of the segments was yours? Was it The Companion? Yes, The Companion, the one with the scarecrow. Yes, I really enjoyed that uh, that segment, but I had not never read your actual original story. What was the differences between the two, and were, or were they, were they pretty similar? I think they made it more about bullies, which I think is, you know, uh, something that's in the uh, public mind right now. But the basic premise of the story was the same. Did you grow up with a lot of scary scarecrows around you as a child? Is that where the story comes from? Did your kids always get frightened? Oh, you know, actually, I didn't. No, I, I actually didn't. I do remember seeing some scarecrows, and I remember us building one out of fun. But it wasn't something that I saw commonly, to be honest. But they always freaked me out when I did see them, or uh, whether it be, you know, when I, I did see them in the field from time to time, or I would see them in pictures or on TV or in films or whatever. They always kind of creeped me out. A lot of great scarecrow stories out there, like uh, Dark Knight of the Scarecrow always comes to mind, a uh, famous right. uh, you know, made-for-TV movie. But it wasn't until uh, I had the uh, uh, I had the, uh, the, pro the producer of the documentary, which is based on you, which is really cool to have your own documentary about your you know prolific writing career. Um, was that was that something they came to you about, or was that like a uh, biography that you were writing that you wanted to turn into a story about your your long career in writing? No, they came to me about that. What happened is uh, Hansi uh, Oppenheimer came to Nacogdoches to interview me for something else, you know, and and then uh, I I wrote a little piece for her and did the audio for uh, a piece on uh, Joe Bob Briggs. And uh, she said, well, next time I'm going to do one on you, which I, you know, I thought, yeah, we're okay. But then uh, she did. She came to Nacogdoches and stayed a few days and uh, did some filming and uh, got, the, got it together. I mean, she's a, she's a workhorse and uh, she can take, uh, you know, five cents and make it look like a hundred dollars, you know, and uh, I was much uh, appreciative of her interest in me and the fact that she did the documentary. It never occurred to me that he would do something like that. You seem to not be able to escape the Western genre in some kind of way. Um, have you always been a big Western fan? Because like Bubba Ho Tep and of course your work with the, uh, you know, the DC comic character Jonah Hex is all tied to Westerns in some way. Yeah, and I wrote a, a, a I guess you kind of say a, a zombie horror Western called Dead in the West and wrote some stories about that same character. And I've written a few short stories and tales uh, here and there that are Western related. Uh, I think that, I, you know, I grew up originally being a great fan of Western films. My father liked Western films, so I would end up watching a lot of Westerns. And TV shows uh, uh, were, that were, Westerns were very popular when I was growing up in the late 50s and through the 60s. So I was uh, pretty much bombarded with them. And uh, I didn't read many Westerns, though until I got a little older and I started reading first the history of the West, which fascinated me. And then I said, well, you know, I'm going to start reading a few Westerns. And uh, uh, I did some, some I didn't like, but those I did like struck me almost deeper than anything I ever read. And uh, some of the great Westerns moved hold me to want second, to write. Joe. Uh, Joe, hold on a second. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay, try saying something now. I just say, you know, I, I got interested in Western history and started to read it, and then I decided to read Western novels, and um, I really got fascinated by the Western genre, and especially the things that I thought were great. It's funny because I, I'm less willing to put up with a bad Western in, instead of putting up with a bad science fiction novel or whatever. Uh, well, I don't put up with bad at all, but back then I would read almost anything. But Westerns, when they appealed to me, they were the great Westerns uh, generally. And they impacted me more deeply, I think, than almost anything. So I've always had this love for them. And not, not only have I done the Western horror, I've written Westerns that are without horror. I've written historical Westerns like The Thicket and Paradise Sky and and things like The Magic Wagon, which has elements of fantasy, depending on how you look at it. And you got heavily into Westerns with uh, animation as well, with, uh, again, uh, writing several animated stories of the character Jonah Hex. And uh, there was an episode of Superman, the animated series called Critters, which has a Western feel to it. As no, that well. was Batman. Batman, sorry, Batman the New Adventures, that's what it was, which had a Western feel to it as well. For Superman, I, I think it was hmm. the uh, introduction of Bizarro that you wrote. Uh, yeah. All of these episodes that you wrote for the DC Animated Universe, uh, were you uh, handpicked for it, or did you pitch an idea? I was handpicked for those, but I actually only did two Jonah Hex things. Uh, I did one of them was a Batman episode called Showdown in which Jonah Hex appeared, and they asked me to do that. They felt like I had the right sensibility because I wrote the comics. I wrote a large number of uh, Jonah Hex comics with Tim Truman doing the artwork. I did three series, which I think was something like 12 to 15, 16 comics. I'm not, I think the earlier series may have had more comics than the latter one. So that was my first writing of Jonah Hex, and then I did the showdown, and then I did a 12-minute one that was untitled uh, that uh, was done for the D.C showcase and um those were the, the the jonah hex i wrote the other stuff i wrote i wrote one superman where i got plot credit but i wrote scripts for batman i wrote four of those critters was really for another series called i think the new batman and robin adventures but the best stuff i did in the batman universe of the animated universe was i wrote a film length one called uh, son of batman and then I wrote those three animated series, uh, Perchance to Dream, Read My Lips, and Showdown, the one with uh, Jonah Hex in it. But in all of those, I was kind of handpicked for them, and I was certainly glad I was. Pension for the Dream, of course, has the iconic catchphrase uh, that became synonymous with the Batman the Animated Series, which was, uh, I am Justice, I am the Knight, I am Batman. Yeah. That was, uh, yeah, that was already established by them. Of course, I, I didn't do that. Is it true that you've won the uh, Bram Stoker Award 10 times? Yep, wow. 10, and I've got the uh, Grandmaster Award and the living, uh, you know, I, I, what do they call it, uh, Lifetime Achievement. That's the one I'm looking at, Lifetime Achievement. And, I'm you know, the Spur for Western writing and the uh, Edgar for crime writing. And I've been fortunate enough to be, you know, acknowledged by in a lot of different genres with a lot of different awards. So, you know, that's nice. Are you, uh, do you, do you know anyone else alive today that has 10 Bram Stoker awards? Are you guys in a, Oh, I think there are others. I'm, I'm sure there are others, you know, to tell you the truth. I have no idea. Uh, I, you know, I didn't even know I was nominated for two of them until I won them. Um, somebody called me, I forget who it was. I think Nancy Collins called me one time and there were a couple of times when I knew I was nominated and forgot about it. So it was a nice surprise. And uh, I did attend the Edgar and the Spur meeting where I got the uh, Edgar for my novel, The Bottoms, and I got uh, the uh, Spur for my Western Paradise Sky. That's quite an achievement. A 10 uh, Bram Stoker Wars. That's that's unbelievable. Well, thank you. I, like I said, I'm sure there are others, but probably King or maybe McCammon. I mean, I honestly don't know. I have, <laughs> I'm talking out of my hat here. Um, I've been a huge fan probably of yours longer than I realized, again, going back to probably Batman, but, uh, even more so when in 2002, the Bruce Campbell movie, Bubba Hotep came out by Don Coscarelli mm -hmm. based on yeah. a novella yeah. of yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a great experience. I, I, I always remember, uh, um, a couple of humorous things about it was that when, Don was first trying to do it. I tried to talk him out of it. I didn't think it could be done. 
Uh, but eventually uh, he got a script together, which I thought was quite good. And he told me, he said, what would you think about Bruce Campbell for this role? Well, the different, the thing that was funny about that is my son just, I think a few days before that said, dad, if you do this movie, uh, can you get my favorite actor, Bruce Campbell? And I said, well, son, I don't really have any pick. You know, I don't get to do that. Uh, they decide who they want. And then when Don called me that and just asked my opinion, I, you know, uh, my estimation in my son's eyes went up quite a bit because we did get Bruce Campbell. <laughs> and, uh, the other thing was Bruce and Ozzy on the set, and uh, he he looked at, at uh, Ozzy and said, uh, what are you doing in this movie? This is my kind of movie. And I remember uh, Ozzy saying, I like the script. So I, I think that's very, those are two of my favorite uh, little uh, anecdotes. Had you seen Bruce Campbell's previous Western work, The Adventures of Briscoe County Jr.? Oh, yeah, I loved it. I de- loved it. He he was so kind one time he sent my son and I for Christmas, the collected Briscoe County, you know, uh, DVDs. But um, I, I, you know, I, I like Bruce from the first time I'd ever seen him, which I guess was. And I would like to see him do more roles like Bubba Hotep or more serious roles. And it's not because I think doing non-serious roles aren't as good. I just want to see him sh- uh, show people how much he can stretch and how varied his career is. I like to do that as a writer. I could just settle back and write one thing, but actually horror is what I've written the least of when you really get down to it, at least from a novel standpoint. And short stories are a very mixed bag, everything from crime to science fiction, to fantasy, to weird, to horror. Uh, You know, I've really, and, and for that matter, just straight stories in like literary magazines and and uh, more mainstream magazine. So I write what I want. I don't think of myself as a horror writer. I think of myself as a writer who sometimes writes horror or crime or whatever, but I'm a writer. And you're also a martial artist too. I am. 57, 58 years. I'm, I'd have to stop and think, but I've been doing it all my life. The only time I haven't really been doing it regularly is during this virus. You know, I've, I've stayed home and I feel really uh, kind of marooned. You know, that's the only thing I honestly missed uh, that I was doing on a weekly basis. Um, I I had to travel a lot. My wife and I traveled a a lot together, too. So we haven't been doing that. And I kind of miss that. But truth to tell, I did so much of it. And we spent so much time overseas that I was kind of glad to have that break. And uh but, uh, you know, the martial arts is the thing that I miss the most, to be honest. I like going out to restaurants. There's a bookstore that uh, I'd like to go to more, you know, regularly. And uh, those are the only things I, I really miss. The virus has been, you know, uh, pretty much my, my lifestyle anyway. I, I stay home and I write. And then I, I would travel to promote books or go to conventions when I was invited. That sort of stuff. But for me, the martial arts, that's, that's really valuable. And, and to not be able to go weekly, because I teach private classes now, that's all I do uh, anymore in the last uh, few years. Is there any information you can give us about Bubba Nosferatu? Do you know anything about that? I mean, is that ever getting made? I know, not the, I, know quarantine, I know the virus has you know, stopped everything from happening. But uh, before that, this movie has... It was never going to happen. Out. Never going to happen? No. Bruce doesn't want to do it. I don't really want to do it. I think Don was the one who most wanted to do it. And then Bruce for a while. And then they kind of convinced me. I didn't think there ought to be a sequel. I still don't. And uh, we did a comic book sequel, a prequel. I I wrote a book called Bubba and the Cosmic Bloodsuckers. And it was made into a uh, uh, a comic book series. Uh, But it's and it's fun. It's it's really good. But I, I think that that movie had such an impact and it dealt with uh, aging and it dealt with, uh, you know, how hero worship, you know, comes and goes. And uh, I just felt like that there wasn't really any redeeming factor to doing another one. It would just be a gimmick, which is not, you know, that's not bad into itself, but uh, you know, we got enough, enough sequels. So I, and I think Bruce kind of came to feel the same way. And, uh, you know, it doesn't mean Don might not do it with another actor in his own script and sometime in the future, or, you, you know, I, th- I always felt that if they just had to do it, the best way to have done it was to have turned it into a television series. But even that I'm not, you know, hot on. 
how many hours a day do you probably spend on writing? Do you like block it out for like, this is always going to be the time I'm going to write and do nothing else. Or does it change? It, it only changes if it has to. I, I normally work seven days a week, about three hours a day. I work in the morning, I get up and have my coffee and I work and then I'm done. And then I read and then I watch movies. And I, and before I did martial arts classes and I still do, uh, you know, light exercises and stuff. I mean, I'm nearly 70 years old here, so I, I'm not uh, doing as hard, uh, you know, stuff as I once did, but I try to walk. I try to lift light weights. I try to do stretches and things like that and, and, and you know, keep up with my martial arts moves. But for me, that's what my day is, is, is those, those things. And uh, so if I get up every morning and write, three hours a day and I give myself the idea of three to five pages a day, then I'm going to get that every day just about. So I feel like a hero every day. And on those days when I get 10 or 15 pages, cause that happens frequently, then I feel terrific. You know, now I've really, really done it. And I just found that by doing that and learning to do it in three hours, I don't get the same diminishing returns. I used to when I first started out and tried to work eight, 12 hours, and I also leave with a feeling of accomplishment. And usually I can write those pages and proof them the same day. And I reread them over the next day before I write. And um, by the time I get through, I've done one, one solid draft with, you know, daily revisions. And I do a polish and I'm done. Now, once in a while, I'll find that I will also come up and work in the afternoon or at night. But that's rare. And it usually is something not related to the project that I'm, that's my main project. I might be writing a novel in the mornings and toying with a uh, script or a short story or an article in the afternoon or at night. So though I will work other hours and other times, it's really rare. And I wouldn't want to be a liar and say I'm working all day and all the time because I'm not. And um, when I travel, when we're overseas, I, 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 it's a little more catch as catch can. I would just say that sometimes when we're traveling, like my, while my wife's taking a shower, I'll sit down at my laptop and write. And um, Or if we've got a little time before we have to do whatever event it is that we're going to do in, say, Italy or you know, France or Germany or wherever we are at that time, then uh, I'll sit down and, and write within just you know those momentary gaps. I might get a paragraph or two. Or I might find that time to get my usual three to five pages, which you know oftentimes when I come to work, whether it's home or travel, I'll get three to five pages in 30 minutes and it'll be pretty much what I want. But I usually have that three hours that I work, meaning that if I get three pages or I get 15 or I get 20, it's generally done within the same time frame. I can't explain that. It's just like I've got that many pages. I type relatively fast. And uh, when it comes to me, it comes to me uh, quickly and I put it out and I generally don't need a tremendous amount of revision. Like there are exceptions. The novel I'm working on now has required a lot more revision than normal. And I'm not really sure why, uh, you know, I, I think it may be because I'm trying to experiment with some things that are quite a bit different than what I've done before. I always do that to some degree, but I think I may be doing this to a, doing it to a larger degree. And so this one has been a little bit more difficult, but, Still, I'm, I work in the mornings and, and rarely any other time. Once in a while, these on this one, I'll take a break and uh, come up in the afternoon as well and proof a little bit because uh, I just feel like it needs it a little more than usual. I have a couple writing projects of my own, one of which needs to wait on the artist to uh, get going on it. And then yeah. I have a bunch of uh, short scripts that uh, have been tried to make into movies but have all – uh, unfortunately failed here and there so but uh i i uh gotten into more mm -hmm. into producing like uh audiobooks and such and i have actual five um audiobooks and one more audiobook on its way coming up soon mm -hmm. yeah I've, I've done some audio um stuff uh I, even recently i have and will probably do more and i'm thinking about trying to do a series of radio uh plays or which I guess would be podcasts these days, but they would be in the old radio format. I've, um, you know, I've sold scripts to Ridley Scott and I've sold scripts to John Irvin and I've sold scripts to um, just about everybody. I've sold options to everybody from David Lynch on. So I've been involved in film for a long time. And in fact, my son adapted one of my stories to screenplay and we've had an option on it for about three years, I think. 
and uh, I'm supposed to direct that. one. But every time it, uh, we get close to it, something occurs. And this course, at this time, it was the coronavirus. It's the same thing with the, my novel, The Thicket, which Peter Dinklage was supposed to uh, star in. And it was supposed to have been filmed in April. And then that's right when everything hit and it got put on the back burner. Or my, the one I was doing with my friend Bill Paxton, who was supposed to direct it. And, of course, Bill died. And, and uh, that one got put on uh, the back burner. And I lost interest in it for a while because it was, I associated so heavily with Bill because we had been working on it. We, we met each other over the novel eight or nine for eight or nine years. We worked on it, you know, until his untimely death, you know? So uh, I've always got film projects going. I have numerous options right now. I have other things that are, have been bought like uh, the big blow by Ridley Scott, which uh, you know, they may or may never film, but I made enough money on it that I can live with it one way or the other. Um. So you were pretty close with Bill Paxton? Yeah, we were good friends. I mean, you know, he he knew a lot a lot of people longer than me and may have been closer friends with other people, but we were good friends. And uh, I, I miss him, you know. We used to talk on the phone a lot. We had a lot of emails and, and texts. I still have him on my on my email and I have and my text and I haven't been and I, I have some recorded recordings that he you know he left messages and I haven't been able to bring myself to uh delete them yet, you know, and uh, um, I, I really liked Bill. Bill and I had a, uh, we had a good relationship and we, we really hit it off, you know, and we're both Texans and uh, we both had a lot of, uh, we had similar experiences. His lifestyle growing up was quite a bit different than mine, but uh, yeah, he was a friend and, and uh, I miss him, but I've also said, I remember I was at an event James Cameron had in Los Angeles. I think my, my daughter was with me. We went out there where they were showing a music video, the only music video that James Cameron ever did that was Bill Paxton's band. And uh, and Bill Paxton also stars in the video. And it's very comic. It's very funny. And uh, I, when I got up to talk, a lot of us got up and, and said a few words about Bill. But I told him, I said, the thing about Bill is if you knew him five minutes, you thought he was your best friend. And he certainly was a real friend. He was a true blue buddy. And, uh, you know, we drove all over Louisiana and East Texas looking for sites and stuff like that. And we got to know each other pretty damn well. And uh, I remember one time I actually spoke to Bruce Campbell when I was in the car. I just said one time I was in the car and we were driving back from Louisiana. And I, I don't remember if Bruce called. I, I think Bruce called about something. I don't remember what or I called him. Uh, but it was funny because, uh, you know, two of the guys that I really – respected and, and and two guys I think that really respected me that we were all at least in one manner or another in the same car at the same time that's awesome that you had such a uh, cool uh relationship with uh Bill Paxton he was definitely a very beloved actor so it's always he nice was, hearing uh stories he was more than him. that he was a uh, was a great director you know frailty is a great example of that and in fact the guy who did the screenplay for the bottoms also did the screenplay for frailty Brent Hanley and uh uh, we 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 um, got together several times, and and you know the thing about um, Bill is that you know he would call me, and it was like we had just talked the day before. You know, we would talk. He talked to me right before he went into the hospital for his operation, the one that that didn't go bad, and I mean that didn't go well, went bad. Excuse me. And uh, I remember we joked about splitting up his goods. You know, hey, well, if you don't make it, you know, me and Brent will split up your goods, which, you know, seemed like a very funny then, but unfortunately it, it, it didn't turn out that way. But we all laughed and I, I, well, Bill and I laughed and that was a good thing because that's what he needed because he was of course very nervous about going in for that operation. You know, it, it, that's the last conversation I ever had with him. I, I think he wrote, I think we had a, text that we shared after that and he, he told me he was about to go in and that he was you know I think it was within a day or two and that he was nervous and uh, I wrote later the text just to see how he was doing and I, I didn't get anything back and then I eventually found out through someone who knew the family well that he hadn't survived the operation. That's really sad to hear. Well he survived the operation actually but then it uh, he didn't get better let's put it like that. Gotcha. They're actually showing um, at the local drive-in near me, uh, Wizard of Oz back-to-back -back with Twister. <laughs> well, that fits. They both have a 
you know, a twister in them. So that works. Yeah. And you know, the people that, uh, that did the weather, um, chasers and people like the storm chasers, they all love Bill. You know, I, the thing about Bill, you rarely, if I never met another person who knew him or had experiences with him that had a bad word to say about him. I remember one time we were out in, um, Los Angeles and me and my daughter and my niece had all gone to dinner with him. And he was a fascinating, you know, conversationalist. And we, we talked about this and that. And, uh, but we, when he drove us back to the motel where we were staying, he stopped, he looked around, he said, wait, uh, this was the hotel in Apollo 13. And, uh, cause I said, your picture's in there. Why is your picture in there? And, he, and I think he had actually forgotten it. And it's because he was, he was really a very modest guy. And he and I talked once and he said something that I always agreed with. And he said, Joe, you and I, all we ever wanted was a place at the table. And I thought, yeah, that's about right. I never got into it to be rich or famous. I got into it because I wanted to do this and I wanted to be a part of that greater community that was creative. And so, yeah, his place at the table was primarily film and my ta a place at the table was primarily prose. And uh, so, yeah, he hit it on the head. I feel the same way. I, I, I do so many things and I'm involved in so many podcasts and media projects and audiobooks and and uh you know struggling as a writer sometimes um you know i have a i have one giant writing project about local filmmakers to new england that are all horror makers but they're all personal stories uh -huh. that i want to see get out there but i'm not doing it for fortune and glory like you know indiana jones puts but it's just a matter about being into that creative world and uh yeah. getting a chance to uh explore things and the reason why i focus so much more on like the radio show the podcasts or even this book uh, again, it's called the New England Horror Filmmakers, is because um, I like the history behind uh, how these things are made and you know how they got involved or whatever. And that's why I always love talking to like people like you or anyone else that come, has come on the show. Like uh, we had another associate of Bill Paxton's on the show recently. We had Michael uh, Michael Bean from mm -hmm. Aliens, and yeah. uh, just and, I know and, who he is. I don't know him personally. But even before Michael came on the show, he had been on the show before. I'd known his wife for years, but we had like an hour and a half long conversation on the phone, just the two of us, talking about like stuff that he's done in his life. And it was just like unbelievable. And then he started talking about like Bill Paxton and, and like all these like, you know, like conversa private conversations and stuff that they had. And that was just, that was just more fascinating than being like, ooh, Alien and Terminator and, and stuff like that. Exactly. Well, you, you know, the, the thing that, that I liked about Bill, and I think I'm the same way, and the thing I like about, uh, uh, you know, the people that I'm really feel, uh, connected to, wh whether I know them or not, is the kind of enthusiasm they had. I remember Bill would call, and he would have all this stuff about the bottoms and how he was going to direct it, and he would get to talking about it, and he would get, really get worked up. And I would put him on speakerphone so my wife could hear him because he sounded like that in that uh, – the voice in Aliens, when he, you know, uh, where he's going, uh, uh, over, you man. know, oh man, you know, keeping up on current events and stuff because he was he truly, got our asses truly, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we just got our asses kicked. But he truly was a, brings a certain amount of recognition, and of course, for an actor, a lot more than for a writer. But the the thing is, is that I consider myself a professional because I, I want to sell things. I want to make money enough to keep me doing what I'm doing and paying my bills right. and making my family, you know, comfortable. But that's not the, that's not the initiating reason I became a writer. And I've always kept that in mind. So I don't let that become the reason I write is just money. I, I make money because it's necessary, but I also know that I'm trying to do what I love. And so far I've been able to for over 48 years. One last thing before I let you go, because I was looking it up online, because you'd mentioned your daughter a couple of times. And then I, I realized yeah. that she's this, uh, you know, famous singer. You two have a book together called Joe and Casey Lansdale's Terror is Our Business, Dana Roberts' Case Book right. of Horrors. What, what's that? Well, what that is, is a super normal detective instead of so supernatural, but it's a lady who uh, teams up with another um, person who is not nearly as educated in that. So it's sort of a, a female home and Holmes and Watson thing dealing with the supernatural. And it's got a lot of action in it and a lot of humor. Uh, we had a great time doing that collection of stories. I, I wrote a few uh, stories about the one character, Dana Roberts, by myself. 
And then Casey wrote, and I wrote a story together about another ca character called Jana, which was mainly Casey's character. And I liked her character better than mine, actually. And we realized that if we put them together and let Jana tell the stories, they would be more interesting. So we begin to write stories uh, together about both of those characters. And uh, I'm really, I'm really proud of them. They're more traditional than I normally do, but I, in a good way, because I like to visit tradition uh, from time to time or to at least use it as a framework for things that, that I like to do. And my son and I have worked together on a number of comics and, and uh, scripts and things like that. And uh, like I said, he adapted a script of mine that I'm supposed to direct if all goes well after all this virus is done. 